Today we decided to solve one of humanity's biggest problems. How to escape a charging shark when it attacks you underwater. This is the current fastest one-person underwater vehicle, which you can buy. Aquadart 770 Extreme. And they claim a maximum speed of 25 km an hour. Now, the maximum speed of a shark that could feasibly attack me is about 25.2 km an hour. So, if the shark I meet is fit enough, I probably got eaten. We need to go faster. That's why we decided to take the matter in our own hands and build the world's fastest underwater jetpack. <laughs> but before we can start assembling, we need to solve the first problem we encountered. And for that, let's do a thrust test. For various reasons, we have a large water tank in our workshop, and it will work perfectly for this. You see, while traveling underwater, the water itself is slowing us down a lot, much more than in air. And so in order to travel at a large speed, we need a lot of force. Here we call it thrust. Specifically, in order to compete at all, we need to beat Aquadart's 79 kilograms of thrust. In other words, a 79 kilogram person standing on your chest would feel the same as Aquadart pinning you down underwater. I don't recommend. So we need to get more powerful motors and test how many kilograms we get using this scale here. Two, one, punch it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before it broke, we unfortunately achieved only about 25 kilograms. With that, we won't even escape from a baby shark. This one is not good enough. Thankfully, we ordered this one, basically the biggest electric motor we could afford. Let's mount it to the rig and test it. It's quite a bit larger than the previous one, and it also weighs about as much as the entire CPS-3 drone, which we built in the previous video. Oh, whoa! That was much more powerful. <laughs> We've realized that this tank might be too small to get a reliable result, but when we punched it to the max very fast, we almost got 50 kilograms. And after taking into account the geometry of the rig, it's actually just 50. So let's double it for a total of 100 kilograms, which I hope is sufficiently larger than the 79 kilo. That is the first component of our new jetpack. However, as you probably noticed already, this design quickly comes out to be extremely dangerous. By strapping these motors to our back, we are becoming a part of the vehicle. A vehicle that can easily sink, since now we got a 100 kg person potentially pinning us down underwater. That's why we decided to make this jetpack able to transform into another vehicle. An underwater scooter. We will test it in both configurations and see which one is better, although I've got a strong suspicion for which one is faster. But when it comes to our safety, the scooter has a big benefit. You can simply dismount by letting go of your hands. Okay, but still, how do we plan on steering and regulating acceleration precisely enough in such a way that we don't crash into the wall? Here's our solution. This is our custom throttle mechanism. It's mounted on the handle and you can push it with your finger just like a non-underwater electric scooter. Here's a spring which makes it return after you let go. Now there are two small magnets on the moving part and in between them there's a small sensor that measures how magnetic field changes. So here is zero speed and here's full throttle. We needed to cover these sensors in epoxy so that they could be submerged underwater. Hopefully it should work the same underwater as in air. But in order to have even more control, we've added a waterproof button which mounts in between the two handles. Clicking it, it cycles through four speed modes, from the slowest to the highest. 
It was kinda hard to find a good waterproof button online, so I hope this one won't cause any problems. Good, that makes the vehicle already pretty controllable, but what if the plastic throttle lever is just simply stuck? and it's forced to accelerate forever. Well, that's why it's always a good idea to add this button. You can only accelerate after pushing this down, so if you let go, it's no longer pressed and the scooter shouldn't accelerate, even if the throttle is engaged. Very fittingly, it's called a dead man's switch. Good, now we have double protection. However, what if the software just fails and the button doesn't work? Well, for that we added a magnetic switch, which mounts in front of the handles. You then attach a magnet right on top of it, which turns on the switch, and so the vehicle. You tie the magnet to your arm with a string, and now, once you dismount, the magnet is also pulled off, and the entire vehicle turns off. This is called a kill cord. And finally, in case all of the systems work, but you still manage to put your hands in the propeller, we added these motor guards with a grill on the outlet so that you cannot insert your hands. You could if you're a baby. That should be enough. We shouldn't die now. But even after all of this, we are still omitting one big thing. How are we supposed to build the main structure, and how to make it both a jetpack and a scooter? Yeah, we had a lot of ideas. We're not sure which way is the best way. Like swappable attachments on the sides. So this is what we call the jetpack bro. <laughs> Guy standing <laughs> on a drone thing. <laughs> Maybe this will allow you to walk on water. Mm -hmm. So that's good. And then... But after a lot of going in circles, we had a bit of a eureka moment, thinking of a very simple structure. Now we have to do a lot of 3D printing, specifically in orange. Thank you Bumble Lab for providing us with all of these printers and sponsoring the video. You might wonder, since it's an underwater jetpack, are these 3D prints waterproof? They are not, but it's only the pipe in the middle that will hold air on the inside. This huge pipe is for the electronics and the batteries. Everything around the pipe can be filled with water, no problem. For some of the bigger prints, we are using the biggest Bumble Lab printer, the H2D. And it has a lot of cool functions, but what's interesting is that even the much more affordable P2S has the same print quality. So these parts are held together using these six metal rods. Then the polycarbonate sheet on the top and the bottom adds strength, while still making the insides visible. And we'll be able to screw in a backpack mount to this sheet here, for when it's a jetpack. Last thing about Bumble Lab, P2S is an upgraded version of P1S, a fully enclosed Core XY 3D printer that allows you to print with advanced materials like ABS or polycarbonate. And so check out their link in the description, since right now they have Black Friday sales. After 3D printing this structure, it honestly appears quite bulky. That's why we also designed big domes for the front and the back. They make it a lot more hydrodynamic. The thing is, it's not only the hydrodynamics of the vehicle that are important, it's the entire human and vehicle system which we need to optimize. That's why we also bought a triathlon wetsuit, which supposedly is a bit more hydrodynamic than a normal one, because of the smooth surface. <laughs> In any case, we know that this scooter and jetpack can probably be much more hydrodynamic, but a simpler design will be much better to start with, and we do believe in our very large thrust. We'll see if that bites us back. When it comes to the thrust and the power these motors require, it all comes from a big battery pack. And this one can deliver 90 times more power than the Lion batteries we normally use. We had to design a separate oh, wow. custom PCB in order to connect these batteries together. And all of these MOSFETs are used to turn the vehicle on when you plug in the turn on key. Because of the power it heats up so much that we decided to add this large heatsink. Now it just needs a mounting plate, because all of the electronics fit onto three rods. We also have a battery management system board, 
and an ESP32, which connects to all of the buttons and runs a program, mounted on a perv board for convenience. After four days of soldering and solving more small problems than we'd like to admit, and then some cable management, we slide it into the pipe. Some cables have to come outside via these penetrators in the end cap, and in front of them these are very powerful electronic speed controllers. They directly control the motors, and they will heat up so much that we need to put them outside in the water for water cooling. These are the last couple of parts we need to attach and screw in, like the button module, the handles with the throttle, and in order to attach the human as a jetpack, here's a scuba diving harness we found. It has very convenient holes in the back. Quick test, seems to work, and it mounts just like that on the bottom, but let's take it off for now. The last part is the dome. <laughs> it's kinda hard. It is done. Let's call it... Hmm. I actually don't know what to call it, because for the first time on our channel, it's not a submarine, so we cannot say CPS. So I ask you, write your suggestions in the comments. Meanwhile, let's do another thrust test. <laughs> no. no. Oh shit, I'm sorry. Immediately we saw an issue. For some reason it worked fine when not submerged, but when we put it underwater it was completely uncontrollable and accelerated randomly. It yeah, it works kind of different. <laughs> it works differently. We need to fix that. We found out that it was likely because when the button was submerged, it would just press by itself and change the speed modes rapidly. To fix it, we disassembled the vehicle and by accident broke our custom PCB board. And then broke the ESCs. And then the BMS. This is what's called integration hell. And this is Peter suffering from integration depression. So everything broke. Yeah, the BMS broke, this broke, and both ESCs broke. For some reason, everything breaks on us. We ordered a new set of components, waited one week, and replaced all of it. So back to the initial issue. The first thing we added are these four LEDs to tell us which speed mode the vehicle is currently in. Now it's in speed mode 1, speed mode 2, etc. That way we'll always know if the speed mode changes by accident. Secondly, we decided to ditch the button. Instead, we can simply double-click the deadman switch to change the speed mode. And actually, just to make it safer, let's make it a quintuple click. That's fixed. However, still, when testing it underwater, we couldn't throttle it very precisely. But we decided that it's good enough, and it's time to test the maximum speed. For that we should find a larger water reservoir. Here is a swimming pool where for some reason they allow us to test basically anything, from ROVs to underwater 3D printers. Our plan is simple, we will start with speed mode 1 and work our way up to speed mode 4. Let's see it in a scooter configuration first and compare it to a jetpack in a second. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. It's very cool. That was cool, but not that fast. Let's do mode 2. Okay. I cannot believe how cool this is. <laughs> this is amazing. I mean, it's not super like fast. It's it's still fast, uh -huh. I think. But it's I'm, I'm unreal the experience. Let's put on the jetpack and turn on the speed mode free. None human should ever have this much power. We can detach the throttle and hold it in hand. <laughs> As I expected, in this configuration the human creates a larger frontal area, making it way less hydrodynamic. 
we didn't even bother calculating the speed, but it was even slower than scooter in speed mode too. So yeah, a jetpack might sound cool, but it's definitely slower. Let's go back to the scooter to actually try to beat a shark. Genius. <laughs> Before we try out the mode 3 and 4, I just want to say that no matter the result, while building this thing we've learned a lot of new skills. And if you also love learning by doing, I think you might enjoy our DIY courses, which we created so that you can build your own projects at home. Currently we have CPS-3 and CPS-5, which are small underwater drones. CPS-3 is for absolute beginners and takes just 4 days to assemble, and CPS-5 is a more advanced design with which you also practice 3D printing and using more advanced electronics. Over the years we've gathered thousands of students who are building these drones, like Mark or Jim. They use our detailed step-by-step -step instructions along with explainer videos at the beginning of each chapter, which give you a deeper understanding for how everything works. And now we give you a free training in the first chapter of each course, which even includes video tutorials for how to use basic tools in case it's your first time. So after watching this video, go to our website to get a free training, link in the description. Now back to speed mode 3. Alright, let's try mode 3. <laughs> it's a running speed. <laughs> How fast it, is it? It was my running speed. By the way, my, like my face. You will see that on the recordings, but. After analyzing the footage, we've calculated the top speed at mode 3 to be at 3 meters per second, which is 10.8 kilometers an hour. It's still way off our goal, but just for reference, the top speed of the fastest swimmers is just 2.1 meters per second. It's time for the highest speed mode, to see if we can be faster than a shark. And here is where we were kind of devastated. Ready? No? One motor quits for some reason. Let me try again. Mm -hmm. Speed mode 4 doesn't work. It turns off the ESCs after like half a second. Here it turned off one motor. It's really unfortunate because we didn't even see this one coming. It's likely because of the power these motors require while accelerating. But the good news is that we think we know how to fix it. We'll do that as fast as we possibly can and test the full power in part 2. So subscribe to our channel to see when it comes out in exactly one month from now. We'll also get to use and experience flying underwater a lot more in the next video. And for now, if you're interested in our DIY courses, remember to get your free training with the link in the description. Thank you. Let's go. <laughs>